Hello everyone, in this video I'll give you an overview of the well-documented collapse of the FIU, Florida International University, pedestrian bridge that occurred on March 15, 2018 and claimed the lives of six people and injured several others. If you've viewed recent videos on my channel, you'll know that I've been covering major civil engineering disasters as well as problems that have occurred with geotechnical design on high-profile projects. What I'm seeing more and more is that the lessons of the past that should have been learned may have been learned for a while, but then many of these same issues crop up and are repeated in future disasters. After I give you an overview of this bridge collapse, I'll focus on the behaviors of key players in this disaster from the design engineers, contractor, project managers, inspectors, and design reviewers. This will take a minute or so, so stay with me. But first, the NTSB, which is the National Transportation Safety Board, issued their investigation report for the causes of this disaster. Let's start out with their key findings and I'll flesh these out a bit as we go. I think it's worth reading this directly. So it's a very concise summary of who did what and uh, what the main issues were. Probable cause, this comes from their report. The National Transportation Safety Board, NTSB, determines that the probable cause of the Florida International University pedestrian bridge collapse was the load and capacity calculation errors made by FIG Bridge Engineers Incorporated in its design of the main span trust member 11 slash 12 nodal region and connection to the bridge deck. Contributing to the collapse was the inadequate peer review performed by Lewis Berger, which failed to detect the calculation errors in the bridge design. Further contributing to the collapse was the failure of the FIG engineer of record to identify the significance of the structural cracking observed in this node before the collapse and to obtain an independent peer review of the remedial plan to address the cracking. Contributing to the severity of the collapse outcome was the failure of MCM, FIG, Bolton Perez and Associates Consulting Engineers, FIU, and the Florida Department of Transportation to cease bridge work when the structure cracking reached unacceptable levels and to take appropriate action to close Southwest 8th Street as necessary to protect public safety. Well, that's pretty direct and to the point. The other all too common theme in these disasters, in my opinion, is the lack of accountability. Nobody wants to admit their part in such disasters and instead blames other people or they agree to no-fault settlement agreements in exchange for cash and release of future liability. In this video, I'll also cover why I think such outcomes are occurring in modern engineering, design, and construction, even today in the United States. By way of background, my name is Casey Jones. I'm a geotechnical engineer with 37 years experience, and I've owned and managed my own engineering consulting firm for the last 15 years. My goal on this channel is to share my experience to provide insight on the issues associated with major civil engineering and geotechnical engineering projects. I sometimes wonder if all the gray hair in my beard has been the result of all these project challenges I've had to overcome over the years. The other thing I'll share with you in my videos is where I can relate instances to my own past mistakes and lessons that I've learned throughout my career. I just turned 60 years old and I often find that I'm the oldest engineer involved with the design and construction project these days. I work in the field of construction phase testing for bridge foundations. So I often have the opportunity to pass along information about technical and management aspects of being an engineer when people are receptive to it. If you like this kind of content, Please support this channel by hitting those like, subscribe, and notification buttons. It'll help me out a lot. Now to an overview of the collapse. In 2013, a federal grant was issued for a total of $19 million for the design and construction of a pedestrian bridge to connect a student housing area to the FIU campus across a busy eight-lane roadway. There have been several near misses between vehicles and student pedestrians over the years, with one student being killed in a collision prior to start a bridge construction in March of 2016. The bridge had a lot of aesthetic design details that didn't provide any additional support to the bridge. In fact, it increased the loading considerably. For example, all the loads were to be carried by post-tension bridge deck girder and the faux suspension system was just for looks. The lead designer, the engineer of record, was W. Denny Pate, a structural engineer with FIG. FIU's Department of Accelerated Bridge Design was involved in an overall project management role. Here's the organizational chart for the project. You can see you have federal funding, goes through the state, goes to local agency. Then you have the city of Sweetwater, Florida, and Florida International University. And then below that you have the design consultants and the construction team. So Bolton, Perez, and Associates Consulting Engineers were involved with the inspection. And then you had a separate post-tensioning inspection firm. Then you had MCM LLC, who was the design builder. Then you had Fig Bridge Engineers, Barnhart Crane and Rigging, Structural Technologies involved with post-tensioning, and Lewis Berger, who was to perform independent peer review. 
After I give you an overview of this bridge collapse, I'll focus on the behaviors of key players in this disaster, from the design engineers, contractor, project managers, inspectors, and reviewers. One of the key aspects of this project is that the bridge was constructed in a laydown yard very near to the final location of the bridge, and then transported using crawler vehicles and set in place using a crane. There were deflection limits set for the bridge during this transport and lifting operation that were exceeded during the move. This resulted in several cracks developing in the truss connected to the bridge deck. As I mentioned, the engineer of record was 61-year-old W. Denny Pate of Figs, Florida office. According to those involved with the project, Pate had this reputation for designing many high-profile bridge projects, and there seemed to be an attitude that apparently developed on the project that what he said about something was the final word on the issue. The bridge was transported and set in place on its piers on March 10th, 2018. Here's a summary of key communication that occurred about the cracking that was listed in the NTSB report. So on March 13th, two days before the bridge collapse, there was an email from the FIG design manager to MCM. And the key response was, we do not see this as a safety issue, referring to the cracking. Then later that day, there was a voicemail message from the FIG engineer of record, Pate, and the quote here is, but from a safety perspective, we don't see that there's any issue there, so we're not concerned about it from that perspective. That voicemail was left with the FIU member on the uh, Accelerated Bridge Construction Team, and uh, they were out of the office. They didn't actually receive that voicemail message until after the collapse had occurred. And again, on March 13th, later in the day, there was an email from the FIG design manager to MCM. Again, we have evaluated this further and confirmed that this is not a safety issue. So pretty direct statement. And then March 14th, the day before the collapse, there was an email from MCM to Structural Technologies stating FIG has further evaluated and confirmed that the cracks encountered on the diaphragm do not pose a safety issue and or concern. Then on March 15th, the day of the collapse, there was a meeting near the site and there was a presentation by the engineer of record from FIG with attendees with Florida DOT, FIU, MCM, Bolton Perez, and others. And the quote here is, and therefore there is no safety concern relative to the observed cracks and minor spalls. Then there were meeting minutes prepared by Bolton and Perez stating FIG assured that there was no concern with safety of the span suspended over the road. And then meeting minutes prepared by FIG based on the discussions at the meeting, no one expressed concerns with safety of the span suspended over the road. Now in the days leading up to the disaster, there was a lot of correspondence, email correspondence and phone calls. And the on-site observation was rather limited by the FIG engineer. It was stated in the NTSB report that the engineer of record, Pate, was on site the morning of the bridge collapse to view the cracks in the bridge. Apparently he was quoted as saying, the cracks look worse in person as compared to the photos that had been emailed to him. But again, he attended those meetings and reaffirmed that everything was fine and they didn't need to close the roadway. So as a result of this meeting the day of the collapse that morning, the engineer of record, Pate, directed that the contractor increase the load on the post-tension strands in the bridge up to 280 kips. But apparently he didn't specify the increments of the tensioning or the sequence of the tensioning. After this meeting and before the post-tensioning work commenced, Denny Pate boarded a flight out of Miami. So he wasn't on site when this bridge collapsed. I find that to be rather shocking. I mean, what did he have that was so pressing that he couldn't be on site to see this important activity and, and whether it was being uh, done successfully or not, or if there were other issues that could have developed. After increased loads were applied to the post-tension members, over 300 tons of steel and concrete fell to the roadway, crushing eight cars, seven of which had occupants. The entire collapse took less than two and a half seconds. Five people were killed in their cars and one bridge worker was killed. Again, nobody involved with the project had recommended that traffic be stopped during this operation. So there were six of the eight lanes of the roadway that were open to traffic, and many of these vehicles were stopped underneath the bridge waiting for a red light. However, there was a project inspector who had recommended that temporary supports, false work, be brought in to support the bridge temporarily. Uh, the engineer of record, Pate, didn't seem too concerned. He didn't see the need to close the road, and he did not affirm the suggestion to install temporary support structures. Now here's a news article that summarized what happened during the day of the collapse. In a morning meeting on the day of the 1.47 p.m. collapse on March 15, 2018, Pate dismissed an inspecting engineer's suggestion that the bridge be shored up as a precaution, something that would have required a long lane or road closure, and came up with a repair plan for the cracks that called for tightening the joint. No one at the meeting, which comprised a dozen engineers and consultants, suggested closing the road during the repair work. Pate then boarded a flight out of Miami as crews went back to work. Instead of closing the cracks though, the repair work overstressed the already failing structural joint, causing it to buckle and the entire bridge span to come crashing down. 
Now getting back to the NTSB report, I will say that I appreciate that they assessed who was at fault and how they were at fault during their federal investigation for this collapse. And I think that's what these federal investigation reports should do. Contrast that with the National Bureau of Standards, now called the National Institute of Standards and Technology, where they only issue data reports, for example, with the Hyatt Regency walkway collapse, or the pending report for the Champlain's Tower condominium collapse in Surfside, Florida that killed 98 people. Those reports from NIST were and will be simply data reports and will not apportion blame or assess fault for the causes of these disasters. I think that's a mistake, and I appreciate that NTSB is more comprehensive in their analysis and reporting. In my opinion, the data results need to be combined with a systems engineering evaluation so that the non-technical project management and human behavior issues that create the conditions for such disasters to occur are documented. This reminds me of the investigation report for the Challenger Space Shuttle disaster. Richard Feynman of the Manhattan Project fame was on the investigation team. He was highly critical of the poor management decisions made by NASA. There was a lot of pressure for Feynman to redact these sections from the official report, which he refused to do. Instead, a compromise was made where his statements were included in the report as an appendix in their entirety. I'd like to read a few sections of the statement made in the report by investigation board member Bruce Landsberg from the NTSB investigation of the FIU pedestrian bridge collapse. Now I'll draw your attention to the very first sentence. A bridge building disaster should be incomprehensible in today's technical world. I would agree with that, and particularly in the United States. The investigation clearly highlighted basic design flaws and a complete lack of oversight by every single party that had responsibility to either identify the design errors or stop work and call for a safety stand down once it was clear that there was massive internal failure. The what is very clear, but the why is more elusive. Despite the public's anger, distress, and disappointment, none of the responsible organizations had any intent for this tragic event to occur or to cause any injury or loss of life. Sadly, good intentions do not suffice for competence and diligence. He goes on to say, engineering schools will use this as a landmark case study for years, and they should. The engineer of record, EOR, employed by Fig Bridge Engineers Incorporated, was experienced, but his calculations were erroneous. Reflection on this event should go far beyond merely a technical review. And they go on to cite the faults with the overall peer review process and project administration by FIU and government officials. And he goes on to cite the mindset that they saw in play here with the other parties relative to FIG. It also appears that every organization absolved themselves of responsibility by rationalizing that if the EOR says it's okay, it must be okay. And if anything bad happens, it's on him. That is not the intent of peer review or safety oversight and certainly fails a system of checks and balances in place to prevent catastrophes like these. We've learned this the hard way too many times in transportation modes. The NTSB's stated role is to not lay blame, but some would say that's exactly what we do when we apportion causation. The human failing that affects all of us is complacency. It's not a term that NTSB often uses, but in my opinion, it is present in nearly every accident and crash. We are creatures of habit, and when we become comfortable through long repetitive experience, the guard often comes down, periodically with disastrous results. That's pretty straightforward and unvarnished and accurate in my opinion. So I had to give all this background to give you my own takeaways about the whys and the hows. As was seen with the Hyatt Regency tragedy, there was a level of hubris and complacency involved with the engineers and other key players on the project. It appears that the engineer of record, Denny Pate, may have suffered from some attitude or need to be the final word on every issue involved on the project. As the NTSB board member states so well, while it's true that Pate was the engineer of record, it's also true that the contractors, project management, and other professionals and governmental authorities should have intervened when these bridge cracking problems arose. Again, they could have closed traffic, they could have provided temporary support for the bridge, paused everything until a full investigation about the causes and implications of the cracking had been discussed and understood. There could have been a recommendation to close the roadway and the construction site and brought in other engineers to provide peer review of the situation. None of this was done. As with the Hyatt disaster over 40 years ago and the ongoing Millennium Tower saga, there was either far too limited or even absent third-party review of the original design engineer's calculations. As I mentioned, the NTSB report was also very critical of Lewis Berger, the firm who provided a limited scope of design checks since the overall fee had been limited. Lewis Berger should have insisted on performing their full scope of review services for an appropriate fee instead of accepting half a loaf and not discovering serious design errors that were made by the engineer of record, Danny Pate. It's amazing to me that engineers with serious design responsibilities, and there were errors in design here, 
but they often focus their efforts on the calculations and end up ignoring or underestimating the implications of structural damage or deterioration that's right in front of their eyes. I think it bears re-showing the risk matrix. Risk is a combination of probability and severity associated with a given event. So you can have a high risk situation if the probability is low, but the severity of the consequences are very high, as was the case with this pedestrian bridge. Although I'm not sure that the probability of failure was low here uh, with all the cracking and the lack of full investigation performed. But in their minds, the probability was low that there would be a problem, apparently. There's also no evidence that the engineer of record had encountered a similar situation as to that posed by the cracking of the pedestrian bridge in his many decades of professional service. Apparently the decision was made to do what I call an experiment. And the decision was made rather quickly. And in fact, so quickly to post tension these members even more that the post-tensioning inspector was not even informed of this plan, and so they weren't on site when this work was performed. This experiment was done with workers on the bridge and commuters in traffic below the bridge. After this disaster, MCM, the design build contractor, filed for bankruptcy and reorganized their operations. The FIG engineer of record, W. Denny Pate, voluntarily surrendered his license to practice engineering in the state of Florida and promised to never seek its reinstatement but uh, he never accepted any fault for his role in this disaster. Payments to survivors and families of the victims totaled $103 million. Just as we saw with the Hyatt disaster, such settlements gets compensation in the hands of the victims and their families in exchange for not admitting any wrongdoing and for discharging any future liability. Again, this is neither morally satisfying or ethically satisfying in my mind. Also, we see in disaster after disaster that no one seems to ever face criminal charges. Although it's reported that a criminal probe involving this bridge collapse is ongoing by local officials. A few days after OSHA issued their report blasting the decisions and actions on this project that led to the fatal bridge collapse, W. Denny Pate was being questioned as a witness in a Miami-Dade courthouse. At issue was the status of his cell phone that was thought to contain photos and other key information about his role on the project leading up to the bridge collapse. He said under oath that his phone was destroyed because his wife placed his pants in their washing machine with his cell phone in the pants pocket. Now let me ask, has this ever happened to you? I think I've had a cell phone for the last 25 years or more, and I've never accidentally sent my phone through the laundry. I'll let you decide if you think this episode suggests problems with the truthfulness and reliability of W. Denny Pate. It's not clear to me whether he's currently practicing engineering in another state. I'm a licensed engineer and geologist in several states, and I know when you renew your license, you have to divulge if you've lost your license or been subject to any disciplinary action by a state engineering board. And I've always thought that if somebody had to report such things that it might be the case that their license won't get renewed in these other states. But I think to me, what's obvious are the shortcomings in the professionalism and engineering ethics with people involved in these disasters. And it's likely to lead to similar disasters in the future. You know. As mentioned earlier, the Hyatt Regency collapse has been taught in engineering schools for the last 40 plus years. And as the NTSB board member pointed out, this FIU bridge collapse will also be studied. But again, how ethical is it to not admit fault when there's such clear design errors and judgment errors? One lesson I personally didn't fully learn until I was about 40 years old was that as an engineer, I was accustomed to being right about a situation more often than not. And whether this was an engineering situation or something else. I learned that I had this bias towards thinking that I was generally right about things when I went to a car show, of all things. Toyota was giving away a hat to people that could answer a trivia question. My question was to name the three hybrid vehicles that Toyota sold at the time. I quickly named the first two, and then I was struggling to recall the, the third vehicle that I had in mind. Meanwhile, my wife's elbowing me in the side because the salesman is repeatedly telling me what the answer is for the third vehicle. And I actually said, no, that's not it, because I was focused on trying to recall what, what I had in mind. And I had an epiphany. It's like, wait a minute, this guy's giving me the answer, and I'm so fixated on recalling what's in my head because I think it's right. After that experience, I decided to be more open to other people's suggestions or opinions and avoid accepting my initial view as the default correct decision. In these disasters, is it such that these people can't admit fault because they're worried about creating additional liability for themselves or their employer? I think that's part of it. Do such engineers avoid admitting fault because they're used to being right all the time and their egos can't accept that they were wrong on such important design and construction issues? If such mistakes ends an engineer's career, are they not admitting fault or error 
in order to preserve their personal assets and be able to retire. But then again, you have a situation like Jack Gillen, the engineer of record and owner of the structural design firm in the Hyatt Regency disaster. He lost his license in some states, but was able to maintain his license in at least one other state. To Jack Gillum's credit, he eventually took responsibility for his role in the disaster, and he talked to many engineers and engineering students to warn them of their responsibility for public safety and design as an engineer. His firm and his professional standing as an engineer were ruined, so he had less to lose by admitting fault in later years. But this is just an observation and not a criticism. So it'll be interesting to see if anything comes of this reported criminal investigation into the FIU bridge collapse. Please let me know what you think about all this by leaving a comment. Also check out the link in the description to get your free copy of my guide to the top civil engineer disasters of the last hundred years. And please stay tuned for future videos.